welcome to Rock Harbor. Good to see everybody here today as we kick off a brand new series, as Brandon talked about, how do we be joyful in our lives? And we're going to begin going through the book of Philippians over the course of the next few weeks. And we're excited to share this series with you. And this is a great, it's a great book. And we think about what brings us joy. Back when I was in college, I was thinking about that same exact thing. And I started dating this girl in 1990, none of your stinking business. And as we, were, as we were talking and communicating, we got about three months into the relationship, and I thought, man, I think this girl, I think she's the one for me. I think that like, this is like the one. I remember mustering up the courage to finally have like, that conversation like, about where I thought this thing was headed, and I'm like, it's time for her to know, for me to express my feelings, and ladies, you have no idea the amount of just everything that goes into that. Like, okay, this thing could fall flat on its face. I don't know how this is going to go. But this night, I'm like, it's, it, the timing was right. The night was right. Everything felt like it was right. And I began to just share with her how I felt about her. And I finally got to that last part where I was going to say those three little words for like the very last time, but it was the first time with her. And I, I finally said, hey, I need to tell you this. I, I love you. And she looked deeply into my eyes deeply. And she said, thank you. (laughs) Followed by these words that I will never forget. I'm sorry, but I just can't say that yet. I had no joy in my life at that time. And her name's Joy. (laughs) I did what every guy would do. I drove her back to her dorm. I didn't even slow down. I opened her door. And I let her out um, as fast as I possibly could. And, and I went back to my room and I'm thinking, what just happened? Because I had these feelings, these emotions, and I thought, I thought she had those same feelings back. I was mistaken. And that didn't feel real good, right? And about three more months goes by. So now we're six months into the relationship. We're driving down the freeway at like 55 miles an hour. And we're joking, laughing. Yeah, we went out again. It's crazy. I don't know how it happened either, but it did. And we're driving, and she goes, hey, I need to tell you something. I'm like, what's up? She said, I want you to know that I love you. I'm like, like what? You know? I mean, no, like, build up to it or anything. It's just not that big of a deal, I guess, at that point. I mean, I already expressed my love. Obviously, she thought she could do that in my truck at 55 miles an hour. So I, I pulled over to the side of the road. I said, I need you to repeat that one more time. She said, repeat what? I'm like, really? Like, really? She's like, what? She's like, I love you. I'm like, It's about stinking time, right? I mean, (laughs) finally, she finally said that, and then our life went on. But that night, I'll never forget the amount of joy that I had in my life, quite literally um, and figuratively, and just as we began to walk through things in our relationship. And and I think a lot of times when we think about the, the word joy, we often get mistaken or we get confused because there's the word happiness and there's the word joy. And if we're to find them, according to Webster, Webster says that that happiness is luck or fortune, Joy is caused by a serious decision or us having an understanding or a cause of delight that we have in our life. And and, and happiness is here today, but it can be gone tomorrow. Joy is enduring. It carries on throughout all of our life. And so the Apostle Paul, he he writes this book called Philippians that we're going to begin looking at today. I'm going to give you some of the brief history of where he was at. I think it's really important as we, anytime we open a new book and begin to study it, that we ask three very important questions. Number one, who wrote the book? Who wrote the book? And we find out that the Apostle Paul writes this book. And, and as he writes this, he, he had had a missionary journey there. He was on his second missionary journey at this time. And, and he had went to the church. He went to Philippi. And as he was there, um, he really fell in love with the people who were at Philippi. And, and this is also one of the four epistles that he actually wrote while he was imprisoned as well. It was written around 61, 62 AD. Historians believe that, that he wrote this epistle. Um, and, and it was the epistle of joy. And this, this was very different from any other book he had written before. Because the other books that he had written, typically he was giving some kind of corrective measure or instruction to the church, but the church at Philippi was much different for him. It was a church that actually brought him joy. It brought him this feeling of contentment because he realized what they were actually doing. And as you begin to look at the book in whole, you can sit down, you can read it in about 30 minutes, 
if you're an average reader. And, and as you read it, you realize that chapter 1 really kind of just it, it outlines an introduction to where we're going. And we're going to look at a few of those verses today. Chapter 2, verses 5 through 11 is kind of the heart of the book. And it's a poem that, that he writes. And it's really about understanding who Jesus is. The fact that Jesus came to earth and, and he lived and, and then he lived and then he died on a cross and he paid for our sins and he humbled himself. And that really is kind of what the whole book really encapsulates and kind of explains is that Paul wanted to share with them, hey, just continue to do the things that you've been doing. I want to encourage you to do this. We find that it also was delivered by a different person. Uh, the first three books uh, that he actually delivered while he was in, in prison was Ephesians, Colossians, and then Philemon. Uh, they had been delivered by the hand of uh, Tychaeus, uh, was, the, was the, the messenger who sent that back to those churches. This one was from Epaphroditus, um, and he actually gave the book to Epaphroditus to go share with the church. And one of the other reasons he loved uh, the church at Philippi was because they actually supported him financially. And we always appreciate it when people support us financially, right? Um, but he had an appreciation a gratitude. He had a joy. He had a contentment in his heart because he saw them doing what they were supposed to be doing. And that was loving God and loving people well. That's what Jesus wants for all of us. And so he gets done with this book and, and he begins just to continue to share with them what they're supposed to be doing. The second question that's important to ask is, why is Philippians so important? And it's kind of what I've already explained a little is because he had an affection for them that he had for no other church that he had written to before. He appreciated them, a deep affection. And we find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 11, and then also in Philippians 4, verses 15 through 18, he kind of explains this about his love for them and, and why he loved them so much. And, and he just he loved what they were doing and wanted to encourage them to continue to move on for everything that they were doing. And he wanted them to have unity in it. And he realized that the reason you can have unity is when you center your life around the gospel, there's a unity like you can have in no other way. Because it's all centered around what Jesus has done for us. And that's what life's really about, is how do I unify my life with other believers in a way that will bring honor and glory to God? Third thing that we always ask is, is what's the big idea behind this book? What's the idea behind it? What is he really trying to get to? And there's a lot of different scriptures that, that many people have memorized uh, from this particular book. Um, one of them is a verse that we're going to look at today in chapter 1 and verse number 6, where the Apostle Paul, he says, and, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will continue to bring it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. He said, hey, he who's began a good work in you, he's going to continue doing that work in you until we actually meet Jesus. Other verses that we find are like Philippians 121, where he says, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. I agree with you. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. He realized that my life was not about me, my life is truly about him, and I'm going to live the rest of my life fulfilling that and following through with what God wants me to do with my life. And then there's the big one, right? Philippians 4.13 that's tattooed across like sports people's chests or wherever. It's, it's a very familiar verse, you know, that we, we talk about quite often where he says, I can do all things in Christ who gives me strength. I can do anything because what Jesus has done in my life and in my heart. And there's so many different verses that we could, we could look at. And, and, and obviously, we're just looking at chapter 1 today. But we see that Paul's joy um, was really with the Philippian church because the affection that he had for them. And, and it's because he talked to them directly about living in community and in unity and fulfilling the things that Christ wants to do in our life. The reason he had joy was because Jesus was the source of his delight. Jesus was the source of he had a reason to live. Jesus was the source of everything he wanted to do. And he wanted to continue to encourage the Philippians, hey, continue to live this out. Continue to live this out. Live for me, live for Jesus, and your life will be exactly what it's supposed to be. Which brings us the whole big idea for today, or what is our sermon in a sentence? And it's this, and it's very simple. You see, joy isn't found in what happens to us. Our joy, we find, what is found from what happens inside of us. Our joy doesn't come from what happens to us. It happens because of what's done inside of us. And Jesus wants to do a work inside of every single one of us. And once we allow him to do that, that's when we'll become the person that we know that God desires for us to be. You see, for many people, joy seems to be just out of reach. Like, why can't I just have this joy? I just want to have joy. And, and, and it's because we focus too much on happiness or things that will bring us contentment. But the only thing that will really bring us contentment in this life, it's Jesus. It's not a thing. It's not another possession. It's not a spouse. 
It's not a mom or a dad. It's not a son or a daughter. It's not a job. It's not money. It's not a second home. It's really just Jesus. And so many of us, we miss out on joy in this life because we've put our focus and our energy and our attention on other things rather than on the things that Jesus wants us to. Now you say, Scott, hey, I'm sitting here today. Obviously, I want joy in my life. So give it up for yourself. I mean, you, you're here, right? It's where you're supposed to be. If you're watching online, if you're watching at the hub, you're like, I'm here. That's what I want. And good for you. Good for you. That's what all of us should so desire. So today we're going to look at three different ways that we believe that, that we can continue to have joy in our life and that we're going to find from our text and our scriptures today. And the first thing that we learn is, is that God is faithful in you. God wants to be faithful, and he is faithful in us. If you have your Bibles, you turn to the book of Philippians in chapter 1 and verses 1 or 2, just kind of a quick introduction, and verses 3 through 5 kind of begin to explain what this actually means, where the Apostle Paul says this. He says, I thank my God in all remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul says, here's the first thing I want you to know. Number one, I'm just thankful for you. You know, thankfulness is a great place for all of us to start in a relationship. Understanding that I'm just grateful for what has happened to me in my life. The Apostle Paul, he had been around, right? I mean, here he is, he's writing from prison at this time. And he's saying, thank you for what you are doing. Now, for most of us, we haven't been in jail very long, or maybe ever, I don't know. But Paul's been there more than once. And he's writing this to these people saying, I just want you to know I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for you and what you're doing and for your partnership, he says, in the gospel. In the gospel. He wants to know he's just grateful for what they're doing. Because he realized that God has been so faithful to him. And God's been so faithful to you. God's been so faithful to me. When I look back at my life and I think about the trials I've gone through, tribulations, heartache, hurt, pain, and you realize that God uses every one of those things for his good. God uses our pain. He doesn't waste it. God uses our hurt to shape us and to mold us in our character into the person that he desires for you and for me to be. It's all a part of his plan. Sometimes you'll hear people say, man, man, it, life's just so hard. It's not good. Things are not going well. My life's just miserable right now. I don't understand why God did this. And I don't understand why God did this. And I don't understand why God did this. And we have to stop. And Paul says, just say thank you because God's shaping you into the person that he wants you to be. And he's never going to waste your pain. I read a story by uh, John Ortberg tells a story in one of his books called Living the Life You're Meant to Live. And he says this about the story about a guy named Tom Schmidt. Tom was a guy who used to go to the nursing home every single day, a senior care facility, and he would just, or every week, he would go once a week, and he would just go around and just talk with the people who were there. He said, you know, I realized that on my down days, when I went and talked to people who were in a nursing home, that my days became much better. And he would go in, and he would just, just share things with people and just talk with them. And one day he was in there, and it was actually Mother's Day, and he had brought some flowers with him, and he was handing out flowers to different people. And he saw one lady, her name was Mabel. He didn't know her at the time, but he walked up to her, and he could tell that she was different. He could tell from the look on her face that she was blind. He could also tell that, that she had cancer and, and actually had began eating away part of her face. And she had a big, thick hearing aid on one ear, and she could barely hear. And Tom thought, if there's anybody that needs to feel loved right now, it's obviously this lady. And so he walks up to her, and he hands her a flower. And he has to tell her what it is because she can't see it. She took it from him, and she held it for a second. She said, Thank you very much. Would it be okay if I gave this to somebody else? I think somebody might need it more than I do. Tom thought, wow. So he got behind her in her wheelchair, and he began to push her down through the hallways. And he went to a place where there was actually some people who were a little more with it and kind of understood what was going on a little bit more. And Mabel began to hand the flower to another lady. And she said, here, I want you to have this. And Jesus wants you to know that he loves you. He said, wow. There's something different about this lady. He said, so every week he would go back and he would always look for her because he knew there was something different about this lady. And as he began to talk to her, he began to hear her story and find out more about her life. She was 89 years at the time, 89 years old at the time, and she had been in this home for 25 years. She grew up on a farm and she grew up with mom and a dad. Dad passed away. She never got married. She was single her whole life. Finally, mom passed away and then she became blind and she had to move into this home. And she'd been there 25 years. He said, I would sit and I would just listen to her talk and I would read scripture to her. And he said, as I read scripture, 
He said, Mabel would begin to quote the scripture back to me because she had memorized it because she had hid it in her heart. She knew God's word. He said, on good days, she would sing songs. He said, she sang awful, but I loved listening to it. <laughs> he said, I would just listen to Mabel sing. I would listen to her sing. He said, one day she was laying in her bed. And as she was laying in her bed, he said, I, I began to ask her some questions. He said, what do you do all day when you're just laying here in your bed? She said, well, I just think about Jesus. He said, really? He said, what do you think about Jesus? She said, I just think about how good he's been to me. Tom said, really? How good God's been to you? Tom said, I'm talking to a woman who's been in a nursing home for 25 years, single her whole life. Cancer is eating away the side of her face. She has a hearing aid on one side. And all she thinks about is how good God has been to her. He said, at that moment, I realized how ungrateful I am for all that God has done for me. Because here's a lady who hasn't probably had the best life in the world. But in her heart and mind, she understands exactly who Jesus is. And she understood that apart from Jesus, she was nothing. And friends, every single one of us, we're at the exact same place. Without Jesus, we're nothing. We might look like we have it all together. We look like everything's great. We got the nice little family. We got the nice little thing going on with kids. We got the nice little house. We got the nice little this or nice little that or nice little this. But apart from Jesus, we're nothing. Here's a lady who realized that, man, God has been so faithful to me. And he's been so faithful to you. And there's times it's so easy to get hung up on the things and the way life is going because it's not going just like we thought it should go. But God says, I've got a plan in this for all of us. The second thing that we realize is that God is faithful in you. He's faithful in you. He says this in, in chapter, chapter number one, verse number six. He says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. He said, it is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all my partakers with me of grace both of my, in my imprisonment and in my defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with affection of Christ Jesus. And here's what we learn. You see that God always finishes what he starts. And that includes shaping our character, no matter what happens in this life. You see, God's molding our character to be more like him. When I look at, at our lives, I look at my life, and I look at my children's life or my spouse's life, and I'm like, man, God is doing a work all the time to bring us closer and draw us near to him. And what he doesn't finish here on this earth, the Bible says he will finish when we meet Jesus face to face. You ever stop and just think about what that's going to be like one day? One day, our life is going to go from this place to heaven. Now, we don't talk about heaven a whole lot. We don't focus on it a whole lot. Actually, there's very few verses in the Bible about it. There are verses in the Bible about it, but very few. I see guys who write books like 300 pages on heaven, and I'm like, how did you do that? There's like 70 verses. I mean, how do you do that? I don't know. How, that's cool, but I don't know how you do that. But we don't think about heaven a whole lot. But one day, we're going to meet Jesus face to face. Do you look forward to that day? Like the day that all those things that have been going on in our life, they're all gone. Verse 6 says, I'm sure he who began a good work in you, he's going to complete it until the end of the day. And one day, the things that are here today, they'll be gone tomorrow. You ever just stop and think about, what's it going to be like one day when, when all of my pain is gone? There are people that walk around in pain every single day. Just pain in their back, their side, arms, legs. Their pain's gone. One day, all the limbs that you have, they're going to function again the way they're supposed to. My dad tells me all the time, son, getting old's not for sissies. My body doesn't work like it used to. I'm like, I know, I can see you. It doesn't work like it used to, dad. <laughs> it's not easy. All the pains that you have, they'll be gone. The things that don't work like they used to, they're going to be gone. They're going to work like they're supposed to. Maybe about your failures, they'll be gone. Your insecurities, they're going to be gone. The hurts, the pain, the broken relationships, one day they're going to be restored. 
they're going to be healed. For many of us, we walk around and it looks like everything's great on the outside, but inside there's so much hurt. There's so much pain. There's relationships that are not right. Maybe between a mom or a dad, a brother or a sister, aunt or an uncle, a friend. And we're like, why can't these relationships just be restored? Why can't they be everything that we want them to be? One day, one day they will be. Because Jesus is going to transform us if we know him as our personal Savior. I love what Revelations 21 verses 3 through 5 says. It tells the story just like I did, but so much better because it's the word of God. Revelation 21 3 says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. Man, I look forward to that day. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Jesus came to make all things new. We just watched a 19-year-old girl get baptized. And as we watch that, we see her life has been changed. And we heard a little bit, a little bit of her story. Here's the cool thing. Everyone that hears this today, you have a story. God's doing something in your heart. He's doing something in your life. He wants to do something so great and so big that only he can get the credit. But for many of us, we start focusing on ourselves rather than focusing on him. And God wants to do a work in your life. And he is doing a work in your life. And we need to make sure we focus on the things that God wants us to focus on and not the things that we focus on. Because the day that we meet Jesus, it'll be a day like no other day. 1 John 3.12 or 3.2 says it like this. It says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we, we shall see him as he is. Do you look forward to that day? I mean, one day I am going to be like Jesus. And verse 6 says that he'll bring it to completion at the day that I meet Jesus Christ. That's what he wants to do in our hearts. That's what he wants to do in our lives as we're open to being used and realizing how faithful he is inside of us. One day we're going to see him. The third thing that we realize in this passage is this, is that God is faithful through you. Not only is he faithful to you, not only is he faithful in you, but he wants to be faithful and he is faithful through your life. Back in our text in verses 9 through 11, it says it like this. It says, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory of God. You see, faithfulness is not produced in us when everything is calm and going our way. Faithfulness is produced in us when things are not going our way and not turning out like we think they should turn out. For many of us, we have these plans and what we, we think should happen. And God says, I want you just to be faithful to me. And I can show you how I can be faithful through you if you'll just be faithful to me and show your love to me. It, it reminds me of the story found in the Old Testament back in the book of Daniel. In chapter number three, about three different guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. For most of us, I say those three names, and you know exactly the story I'm going to talk about. But maybe you're here today, and you don't know about this story. There were three guys who were there that said they were going to be faithful to God and to God alone. But there was this king named Nebuchadnezzar. That's a really weird name, but that was his name, King Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar said, I, I want you to bow down, and I want you to worship this idol right here that was made of gold. And these three guys said, that's not what we're going to do. We're not going to worship an idol because we only worship God. We're not going to worship an idol. In chapter 3, in verses 16 through 18, this is the story and how it goes. It says, In Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Now, normally you don't talk to a king like this. Hey, we really don't even need to talk to you about this, king. So I'm going to address it, but you're not even worthy for us to even talk about this right now, but I'm going to give you a shot anyway. He says, If this be so, 
Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. This is one of the most remarkable statements on faithfulness in all of Scripture. Because inside these words, what they say is, our God is able. Our God is able to work in and through you. And they said, we're not going to bend, we're not going to bow, and we're not going to pray to any other God besides our God. And in their lives, we see how God wants to work in and through them to a whole nation to see this. Here's the amazing thing about God. He wants to continue to do the same thing in your life and in my life. He uses people today to work through to show his glory and his goodness. But there are times, if we're honest, that we go, man, I don't know that I can continue to trust God like that. We think, can God really handle all that I am? Can God really handle what's going on in my life? Because, Scott, you don't actually know my life. You don't know what's going on in my life right now. You don't know what's going on in my marriage. You don't know what's going on in my singleness. You don't know how difficult this is being single. Scott, you don't know what it's like with the kids that I have. God, you don't understand what my parents are like. My parents are cray. I mean, they're like cray cray. They're jacked up in the head, Scott. Welcome to the club. I mean, what can I tell you? Hope you're not watching this, Mom. Sorry. But we think, man, I, I don't know. Can God really do all of that? When I have those times, you know what I try to do? I just try to remind myself of Scripture. When we say things like, you know what, God, can, God can't handle my problems, what God wants us to remember is Ephesians 3.20. It says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. I love that. Because there's times that I don't even ask for things because I can't even think to ask for it. The Bible says that, that, that God, he, he, he wants you to ask it. He says, according to the power that works within us. God can deliver it. God is plenty big to handle whatever problem you're going through. Maybe you think that, you know what, my need, maybe my need for God is just too great. He can't fulfill all the different things that I need in my life right now. You don't understand my situation. You don't know what's happening to me. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. And those days when I go, God can't handle all this? Yeah, yeah he can. He tells us he can in his word. Maybe you say, you don't understand how the temptations that I struggle with, Scott. I have these temptations that I just can't get around. I mean, they're just so difficult for me to deal with. Maybe it's, it's a temptation to, to spend money, or maybe it's a temptation to, to be with someone that I know that I'm supposed to be with, or it's a temptation to, 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 to act in a certain way, or maybe there's a drug addiction, or maybe there's an alcohol addiction, or maybe there's some kind of addiction. You don't get it. You don't know what it's like, Scott. You don't understand how it is when you have that kind of a temptation. You know, I, I may not, but God does. He tells us in his words... Hebrews 2.18, he says, for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Don't forget that, that God was actually, Jesus was actually tempted in the garden, right? He was, he was tempted at that time. And Satan said to him, hey, if you can take this from me, go ahead and take it. Are you that big God? Can you, can you do that? Jesus, can you handle that? Can you take on this? Jesus said, I, I, I could, but I'm not going to because I'm going to be faithful to my father's plan. He understands temptation. Maybe you say, my sins are just too numerous, and you have no idea what I've done. You don't know what I've said. You don't know acts I've committed. You don't know what I did last night. You don't know what's going on in my life right now. Man, my sins are just too big. Hebrews 7.25 says this, consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to him, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. God can handle your sin. God can handle your problems. God can handle your temptation. God can handle all the situations in your life. But when we say, okay, I give up, God, I'm going to let you do this in my life. Maybe you say, you know what, the enemy's just too strong. The enemy's too strong. I'm too weak. I can't do this on my own. Philippians 3.21 says, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. God can handle it. We have to remember things like our God is the one that has the power to part the Red Sea so an army can walk through. Our God has the power, has the power to stop the sun. Our God has the power to create everything that we enjoy today. 
He created the stars. He created the moon. He created the sun. He created water. He created earth. He created you. He created me. Our God is able. And he wants to work in you. And he wants to work through you. But the choice is up to us. What will we do with that? You see, my God, he can heal the sick. He can heal the lame. He can heal the blind. He can love when we can't love. He can care when we can't have the power to care. He can continue to give us the strength that we need when we have no more strength. He can give us exactly what we need when we continue to be faithful and to draw near to him. He can heal the brokenhearted. He can heal the marriage. He can soften the hardest heart. He can bring life. He can bring love. He can bring encouragement. You see, our God has the power to heal addictions. I've seen him do it. Our God has the power to provide in ways that we can't think or even imagine he can provide. Our God has the ability to reconcile things that many would say are unreconcilable. I can't tell you how many people I've sat down with, couples who were broken, who had made awful choices, who had sinned against God, who had sinned against one another, and watch him restore and heal that marriage. God's in that business. That's what God wants to do in our life. And he works, wants to work in you and he wants to work through you. But will we let him? Isaiah 43, 2 says this. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, they shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. You see, the true litmus test of faithfulness is when we stand before God and life doesn't turn out the way that we think that it should. And we turn back to God and say, you know what? I'm just going to continue to be faithful no matter what. Because I know you have a greater plan in my life where you're going to be working through me. And only you could do that. When I think about how God has done that in my own life, it's amazing to me. Think about the Apostle Paul. He's the one who's writing these letters. And I don't think his life went the way that he thought it was going to. Here he is at one point in his life persecuting Christians, making fun of them. And then he goes on this road, and this big light shines to him, and his eyes are opened up to what God has for his life. And then he says, you know what? Okay, I'm going to follow God. And I'm sure in his mind, he thought, if I follow God, everything's going to go just the way that it's supposed to go. But where does he find himself? He finds himself imprisoned, writing a letter to a church in Philippi. He found himself shipwrecked. He found himself beaten and flogged. Here was a guy that his life didn't go exactly like he thought it was going to go. And at the end of all of it, he's still single. And we go, wow. Here he is writing back saying, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. I'm so grateful for what you've done in my life. Thank you for continuing to partner with me. Thank you for continuing to partner with me in the gospel so that other people might be able to hear. Some of the last words that Paul ever wrote are found in 2 Timothy in chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. This is what it says. It says, I have fought the good fight and I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me only, but also to those who have loved him at his appearing. He says, I've run the race. I I finished it. I've done what I could do. And now I'm going to receive a crown one day. But not just I will receive it. He says, when you continue to allow God to work through you in your life, you too can receive that. Because one day, we're going to meet Jesus face to face. I love what he goes on in verse number 12, the last verse we'll look at in this portion of scripture. And this is what he says. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. You see, Paul was faithful no matter what was happening in his life. And as he was faithful, God was continually drawing near to him and nigh to him and being faithful to him. And Paul says, the reason that we do all of this, the reason I'm going to allow God to continue to be faithful to me, in me, and through me, is because it's going to advance the gospel. And that's the reason why every single one of us are here today. God has chosen to use you, and he's chosen to use me. And he goes on in that last verse, in the verse number six that we've, we've talked about, and knowing that he's going to continue to do a work inside of you, he's going to complete it at the day of Jesus Christ. 
You see, God's faithful to you. God's faithful in you. God is faithful through you. You see, our joy, it's not found in what happens to us. Our joy is found in what happens inside of us when we understand who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And we continue to share that with a lost and with a dying world. Let's pray today. Father God, we're so grateful for your word. God, you tell us it, it doesn't return void. God, your word is what speaks life into us. And we look at these few verses that we looked at from the Apostle Paul. and God, you have been so faithful to us. God, you're faithful in us. You're faithful through us. And God, our prayer today would be, how do we become more like you? God, I pray for those who may be here today. Maybe they're struggling. Maybe there's something going on in their life with an addiction, or maybe there's a temptation, or maybe their marriage, or maybe they haven't found the one, and there's just a struggle in that in the singleness. Father, we know, God, that you do work all things together for good to them who love you, to those who are called according to your purpose. Father, we trust you with that today. Lord, we love you. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen.